Number 20. And uh, we got down there to uh, John 20. John 20 and verse 17 and 18 there. I think that's where we left off last time. John 20, verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and your Father, and to my God and your God. We went over that. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. As I mentioned last time, I believe, Mary Magdalene was the woman who had uh, seven devils. And uh, the verse for that is in Luke 8, verse uh, 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So she had seven devils and God saved her, God healed her. And uh, Mary Magdalene was one of the Marys that was at the cross in John 19, 25. And now she's the first one there at the resurrection. Well, I tell you what, that's the grace of God. Amen. God uh, blessed her to be able to do that. Uh, verse 19. All right, now we're getting into a whole different thing here. And the guy, a guy that's going to be called Thomas is going to enter into the picture. Verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, the first day of the week is Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. All right, Seventh-day Adventists are still observing the Sabbath in the Old Testament. We don't go to church on Saturday. We go to church on Sunday. Sunday's the first day of the week. All right, we have a New Testament. All right, you got to move on from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Anyways, uh, second grade English. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, so they're assembled on the first day of the week. You're in a church service for fear of the Jews. They're having church for fear of the Jews. This is what they have to do in China. You know, in China, they can't meet publicly. They have to meet like underground. They have to meet like in houses. They have to meet, uh, you know, secretly. And for fear of the Chinese government, and these not just China, but a lot of other countries too. And if you're Christian, I mean, folks, we don't realize how great we have in our country right now. We really, I, don't, I don't know how much longer that freedom is going to last, but as of right now, I mean, we don't really have to worry about the government coming in here and shutting us down and taking us all to prison. I mean, I, I know the country is getting pretty bad, but I mean, as of now, we don't have to worry about that. In other countries, you literally have to worry about that. And uh, so then the same day at evening, so Sunday night, Sunday night service, being the first day of the week, Sunday, when the doors were shut, where they, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Of course, we, we ought to be glad when we see the Lord, see the Lord do things. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, uh, they are retained. Uh, verse 24, But Thomas one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. <coughs> so Thomas misses this church service. I got a message I preach, and I'll give you the outline here in a minute. But I brought it as a message, I don't know, two or three or four years ago. Matt's got it back there on the CD. Uh, some things you miss when you miss. Thomas missed the service. And it doesn't tell why he wasn't there initially there in verses 19 to 23. 
But now in verse 24, he shows up. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's why he's called Doubting Thomas. 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. In other words, just like I said last time, it'd be just like now. The, the doors of this building, of this sanctuary are closed. And it'd be just like Jesus appearing right up here in the front. Boom, just like that, Jesus appears right there. He didn't, doesn't say he walked through the doors. doesn't say he came through a window. doesn't say he come through the attic, you know, and let himself down by with a rope or something. It, he just appears. Imagine being able to do that, just like that. All right, verse uh, 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. I mean, he looks right, right straight at Thomas, because he knows he's doubting. Thomas is doubting. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He calls him God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this, in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Alright, uh, Thomas is not present there, initially in verses 19 to 23. But then starting in verse uh, 24 to 29, Thomas is there. And Thomas missed. Uh, he missed, and I, I brought a message, some things you miss when you miss. Uh, first of all, uh, notice he missed the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. Look at verse 19. End of verse 19, it says, Then came... Uh, came, uh, the fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them peace be unto you he stood in the midst so uh, they, Thomas missed the presence of the Lord so when a Christian uh, uh, misses, the, misses the church service some things you miss when you miss uh, you miss the presence of the Lord now the Bible says in Genesis 4 when God cursed Cain, it's, he says that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He went out from the presence of the Lord. I'm not trying to get smarter like or nothing, but a lot of professing Christians today in America, they wouldn't know the presence of God if it bumped up against them. And uh, look at, turn back to Exodus 33. I want to show you something what Moses said about the presence of God. Exodus 33, 15. And uh, folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's what we need in our lives. We need the presence of the Lord in our church services, in our homes, in our marriages, our children, our grandchildren. you got to have the presence of the Lord. Look at Exodus 33, 15. Exodus 33, 15. And he said unto him, uh, or 14 says, And he said, God said to Moses, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, Moses said to God, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. If God isn't with us, then all is in vain. You see that? Moses said, God, if your presence is not going to go with us, don't carry me up hence. I don't want to, I don't want to do nothing without your presence. All right? Turn to uh, Psalms 23, a great psalm that people like to have read at their funerals. Uh, psalms 23 and 23 5 the psalmist says thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies thou anointest my head with oil my cup runneth over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life i will dwell in the house of the lord forever verse 4 says yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff that comfort me when you read this 23rd Psalm, there's only, 20, uh, there's only six verses. You can see that the presence of God, he wants the presence of God uh, with him. He talks about the presence of his enemies. Uh, in thy presence is fullness of joy, Psalm 1611. 
I look at Psalms 139, Psalms 139 and verse 7, Psalms 139 and uh, verse 7 talks about the presence of the Lord. Psalms 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? All right, David has said, God, you know, I can't go nowhere. Uh, verse, uh, verse 4, for there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. I mean, you think about, you read these verses in Psalms 139, you see that God is omniscient. An omniscient God means he knows everything. As I mentioned, I think last week, you and I have to go to college for eight or ten years to be a doctor and be a brain, 12 years to be a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon or whatever. A bunch of years. God knows all about the heart. He made our heart. He knows all about the brain. Or he don't have to go to college. He, don't have to, he already knows everything. Imagine a being that knows everything. As a matter of fact, God not only knows what we think, or God not only knows what, we're, what we say and what we do, He knows what we think. Imagine a being that knows the thoughts of every human being on the earth right now at the same time. That blows your mind when you think about it. Think about a being like that. That's God. Why don't people want to serve him? Isn't that something? People don't want to serve him. Uh, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He says in verse 6, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. David says, I, I, You're an all-knowing God. I can't even attain to that so that's omniscient. Look at the omnipresence in verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? You see that? And then he's omnipotent. Omnipotent uh, means he's got all powers given unto me in heaven and earth. He said in Matthew 28, 18. But look here at Psalms 139, 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. See that? You go on and read verse 15 and 16, you see that he's omnipotent. He's omnipotent, he has all power. He's omniscient, he has all knowledge. And he's omnipresent, he's in all... He's, you can't get away from God. That's what David says here. Verse 7, Whither shall I flee, or whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? You see that? So, uh, remember Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord? It says in Jonah 1 verse 3, he didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach. He didn't want to answer the call of God. And Jonah 1 verse 3 says, Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, and God brought a whale. Imagine that. That shows you that God will go to almost any length to get you and I to do his will. And uh, like one preacher said, I heard him say years ago, he said, God won't make you do anything, but he can sure make you wish you had. Yeah. And Jonah wished he had, because he got, imagine getting swallowed by a whale. Now, I know a lot of the Bible rejectors, they deny that and say there's no way, this and that. But the Bible says it. I believe it. Amen? Amen. And can you imagine being, the inside, being on the inside of a whale? I wonder what it was like inside there. His digestive system, the acids and all the different things in a whale. And then, he, and then it says he vomited him out on the earth when once Jonah said, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. I'll do what you told me to do. And then he, it says he vomited. I bet they changed that word in the new versions. He uh, vomited him out on the, uh, out on the shore, and uh, he, went, he went and preached. And had the greatest revival recorded anywhere in the Bible. The greatest revival in the Bible is not in the book of Acts. It's not in the Gospels. It's not in Revelation. It's not in Romans or anywhere, Genesis or anywhere. The greatest revival recorded in the Bible is a whole city got right with God and Jonah. And the preacher didn't want to go there. And I think Ruth brought it out. But Ruth asked me this morning at the door back there. She was asking me how that Jonah, with his uh, uh, him not wanting to go, and then he goes and the whole city gets right with God. She, she said, how will his works come out of the judgment seat? Will he get any fruit for that? Will he get any rewards for that? Isn't that what she was asking? He, he was angry about it. Remember, he sought and acted like a big baby. He went and got under the juniper, under the, uh, not juniper tree, that was Elijah. But that was another little baby fit there in 1 Kings 19. But uh, you know, in, uh, there in uh, the book of Jonah there, the gourd, remember he sat under the tree there and the gourd hit him in the head? 
And he got more upset. God said, you're getting more upset about the gourd and the worm and the gourd than you are these people's souls in the city of Nineveh. And Ruth was bringing out, you know, I wonder how his, I wonder how it's going to come out for him at the judgment seat. And you find in the book of Jonah that God prepared a lot of things. God's a God of preparation. You know, uh, uh, what was his name? The coach of uh, Alabama Crimson Tide football back uh, years ago. Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant said, uh, if I quote it right, remember, he said a lot of people are willing, he said a lot of people are, want to win or are willing to win, but they're not willing to prepare to win. See, what the college football teams or any sports team, what they do on the field during the regular season is determined by the practices before the season and during the season. What they do on the, on the field and, and when the real games come up. You can't just start a season of football, baseball, basketball, soccer, whatever it is. You can't start you know, the day before the first game and say, okay, I'm ready to play. No, they start weeks and months ahead of time. Conditioning, lifting weights, running, Cardiovascular. I mean, they, they get out there. I mean, they, you know, this is and uh, and so. But he, Bear Bryant said a lot of people are willing to win, want to win, but they're not willing to prepare to win. God's a God of preparation. In the Book of Jonah, God prepared a vehement east wind. He prepared a great fish, a whale. He prepared. It says this specifically in the Book of Jonah. He prepared an east wind uh, out of the east. He prepared a gourd. He prepared a worm. He prepared. <coughs> There's like five or six things it says in Jonah that he prepared. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, 2. Uh, I have not seen or ear heard either in the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Uh, Thou prepare for them a city in Hebrews 11, 16. Uh, so uh, God's God of preparation. God prepares. All right, John 20. So uh, he missed the... Uh, 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 Thomas missed the presence of the Lord here in John 20 and verse 19 because Jesus stood in the midst and saith unto them peace be unto you and then secondly not only did he miss the presence of the Lord but look there if he would at verse 19 again he missed uh, he missed the peace the peace of God last few words of verse 19 he said peace be unto you verse 21 then said Jesus to them again peace be unto you See that? Look at the end of verse 26. Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Three times. At least three times. He says, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. What do you miss when you miss church service? You miss the presence of the Lord. You might miss... God does things. God does things in a church service that He doesn't do anywhere else. Right. There's something about God's people assembling together. And I know this is just a brick and mortar building. I know that. We don't worship a building. I know it's just it's going to melt with fervent heat. I know all that. But th this is the place that we've set aside to come to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And God will do things in the midst here in, this, in these services that he won't do anywhere else. Now, you say, what about under the tent? Well, that we meet together, assemble there. God can do things under the tent. And God has done things under the tent. In the last few years. I'm talking about when God's people meet. There's something about, there's some things that God will do for you here at a church service that he won't do at King's Island. Now, I'm not preaching against King's Island. I'm going to go to King's Island. I'm going to go to King's Island. But I'm just saying, it, it, there's things God will do for you inside this building at a church service that he won't do in a fishing boat. Amen. I'm not preaching against fishing. You want to go fishing? Go fishing. All right? Or a deer stand. All right? God, God generally don't do that, those things. And, and I'm not preaching against those things. There's nothing wrong with those things. I'm just saying that God, there's something about the house of the Lord, the place set aside that God's people meet together in one mind, one accord, and God does things. The preacher gets up and, and speaks, and the words, the words that's coming out of my mouth right now isn't me. I mean, it's me. It's me, but it's God. What you want to hear from, you want to hear from God. You don't want to hear from Steve Coven. What you ought to pray before every service when you come here is, if, if I'm preaching or whoever else is preaching or teaching whatever, you want to say, God, wherever you go to hear any preaching or teaching, you want to say, God, set that preacher aside and speak through him and show me something and give me something about my life and about my Christian life 
and, and so forth and, and things you want me to do or not do or whatever and deal with me, Lord, through that preacher, through his vocal cords that God made, all right, through through him. That's what you, that's what, you know, sirs, we would see Jesus is what they said there in the Gospel of John. You want to say, God, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Uh, and so peace, uh, he says it three times, peace be unto you. So you miss the peace. And of course, a lot what people are missing today in this world is peace. Have you ever seen so many miserable people in the world? It's like everybody wants to fight, argue, cuss each other out. People look so miserable. Even some professing Christians, unsaved people are like that. But even a lot of professing Christians, they don't have the peace of God in their hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, by the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful, Colossians 3.15. So we're, that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 26, 3. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalms 29, 11. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. How much of that do you see in America today? Love, love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, a lot of people don't manifest them in their life. Uh, John 14, 27, Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be tr uh, troubled, neither let it be afraid. Uh, Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have peace with God when you get saved. You've got peace because you're saved. But then you're to let that peace of God rule in your hearts in your Christian life every day after you're saved. Because that peace of God can lead your heart. You're not right with God, you know, and uh, things aren't right in your life or whatever. So that peace of God, that's what people are missing. You can tell it when you talk to them, you look at them. Watch people in America today. Watch people in Highland County. Look at people. A lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people don't have the peace of God. And then thirdly, Thomas missed not only the presence of the Lord and the peace, peace be unto you, three times he says it, but then he missed joy and gladness. Joy and gladness. Look, where's that at? Verse 20. Verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands, and his side, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They was glad. I'll tell you what, aren't you glad when you see the Lord, when you see God do something in your life, when you see God answer a prayer, and you know it was the Lord? It makes you glad. Nobody else can do that for you except God. Joy and glad. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10 uh, <clears throat> Thy word was the joy of my heart. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Uh, Psalms 126, verse 5 and 6, about soul winning and witnessing. Talks about joy. Uh, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy, shall come again with rejoicing. It's twice. Bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126, verse 5 and 6. There's nothing like seeing somebody get saved. There's nothing like Amen. seeing a backslidden Christian rededicate and get their life right with God. It, it, just, it brings joy. And uh, well, that's what we need. We need the joy of the Lord. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Jesus said, ask, me, ask that your joy may be full in John 16, 24. He says that he wants our joy fulfilled in us and to remain in us, John 15, 11. Uh, Paul said, or James said, that my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. James 1, verse 2. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see, not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can't explain to a lost person the joy and the peace that you have because you're saved. It's unspeakable. When it says unspeakable, it doesn't mean that you don't talk about it and tell people. Unspeakable in the sense you can't describe it. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The spirit, uh, these, uh, spiritual kingdom, uh, the uh, but the fruit, of, uh, but the fruit of the spirit is joy, peace, uh, and so forth. So joy and gladness. Uh, joy and gladness. Paul said, uh, but none of these things move me to your account. I, my life, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Paul said, I want to finish my course with joy and the ministry.
which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, verse 24. He said, I want to finish my course. Have you ever seen a golf course? There's you know, hole number one, two, three, there's 18 holes, 18 holes of golf. All right, Tiger Woods and all those guys get out there and hit that ball 300, 400 yards. And I, I, can't, I can't hit 20 yards. I tried to play golf about 20, back in the 90s with a guy, a preacher up in uh, Northern Ohio. And I got a crushed left hand, so I couldn't even hold the club very well. And uh, I hit the, I, he'd get up there. I said, you smart, Ellie. And he'd get up there. He's, he's, he's a member of a couple of different golf clubs and stuff. And uh, pastor of the church. And he'd get out there, and he'd hit that ball two or 300 yards. And I'd get out there and hit it 20 yards. If you could lose your salvation, I'd have lost it that day. I'm going to tell you what. If you could lose your salvation, I would have lost it. You know, I never really had respect for the game of golf until I played it. I used to make fun. I got a cousin, John, uh, that uh, he's a preacher. He plays golf. And I used to make fun of him. Like, oh, I'm going to go play golf. I like football and basketball, you know. And uh, and uh, I said, you want to play golf? Well, there he goes. He's going to try to hit the ball in the hole. I, I kind of make fun of him. Well, until I got out there and played it, you got to be talented. To hit that ball three or four hundred yards like that and get it in there in three or four tries, what they call it, birdie and all that—I don't know—I don't even know what it means. And uh, so the par, you know, the par means you got to get it in there in four or five tries. You know, the ball you got—it's four hundred yards away. It take me twenty-five times to get it in there. But anyways, uh, I don't even know how I got off and all that. But anyways, <laughs> man, my mind is everywhere tonight. But uh, so it might, yeah, of course. A golf course. I mean, most people that play golf, they don't start the sixth hole, the ninth hole. Start with number one. You go to number two, three. It takes a while. Two, three, four hours. Especially if there's two or three or four of you, got a couple of buddies with you, and everybody's got it. So it takes hours. So you start, but it's a golf course. You got to go the course, one through eighteen holes. From the time you get saved till the time you die, you have a course that you run. And he said, my course. My course is not your course. And your course is not my course. And your course is not each other's course. Paul said that so that I might finish my course, not the course. The course would imply that it's one course for every Christian. No. But I might finish, so I might finish my course with joy. All right. That's uh, Acts 20, 24. And the ministry. Then he says it again in Acts, or, uh, 2 Timothy 4. Uh, eight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to be only, not to be only, but also, also that uh, love is appearing. Oh, it's in 2 Timothy 4 7. Sorry. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So he uses the words my course in 2 Timothy 4 7 and Acts 20 24. So from the time you get saved, that's what God will deal with you about at the judgment seat. The time you get saved till the time you expire, die or your rapture. And that period of time, however long that is, some Christians it's longer than others. Some Christians are saved longer than others. And uh, so you'll 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 stand before the Lord for that. And uh, he will how you ran your course. That's why along your course, you don't want to miss God. You see, when you go along in your course, one, the first hole, the second hole, golf course, as you go along in your uh, course of life, you pray about things. You don't want to miss the will of God about things. You pray about things in your finances, in your children, your grandchildren, uh, you know, in your home, in your your uh, job, your business, whatever it is. You, you've got a course to run. And God will talk to you and deal with you about that. We, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 12, as I said again, for the Ingestat, that's what he primarily talked about, preached about when he was here, Father. So, I mean, just as sure as you're sitting in these pews tonight, and as sure as I'm standing behind this pulpit, you and I are going to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. That ought to, that ought to do something to us. Amen. You think about that. Uh, joy and gladness. Then uh, Thomas missed the great commission. Look at verse 21, John 20, 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, 
Even so, send I you. Verse 21, he missed the Great Commission. He wasn't there. Doesn't tell anywhere in John 20 or anywhere else in the Bible why Thomas didn't, why he missed. But uh, the, first, the first time they were there, he met there. But uh, so he missed, and he missed the Great Commission. And the last thing Jesus said when he left this earth in Acts 1 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. So they missed the Great Commission. And then they missed. They miss the uh, power. Look at verse 22. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Miss the power of God there, the Holy Ghost. The power. Uh, references about power. I'll just give you a few. Man, there's a bunch of them. Deuteronomy 8.18, talking about God, He giveth thee power to get wealth. 2 Chronicles 25.8, God hath power to help. I'm glad He's got power to help us. Amen. Amen. Uh, Matthew 9.6, Mark 2.10, Luke 5.24, He has power on earth to forgive sins. Well, if God has power on earth to forgive sins, we don't need a man to try to forgive our sins. Uh Luke 5, 17, the power of the Lord was present. Luke 9, 43, they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Luke 12, 5, talking about the Lord, he has power to cast into hell. Uh, he gives you power to become the sons of God when you receive him. John 1, 12, them gave you power to become the sons of God. Uh, John 10, 18, he said, I have power to lay it down, talking about his life, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I received my father, John 10, 17, and 18. John 17, 2, he has power over all flesh. Uh, John 19, 10, you know what Pilate said to Jesus when he's talking? Right before he cru they got crucified him. He said, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify, I have power to release you? You know what Jesus said to Pilate? He said, thou couldst have no power at all except that were given thee of my Father. You know, what God, you know what the Lord was saying? Pilate, the only reason why you're in the position you're in is because of the permissive will of God. And that's what a lot of leaders don't realize. That's why a lot of uh, you know, presidents, prime ministers, uh, uh, princesses, and all these different dictators, and all these rulers, and all these people around the world. I mean, it's hard to believe sometimes as wicked as some of these people are, but they are in the, they are in the position of power. Powers that be are ordained of God, Romans 13.1. So they are in there because of the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God. As I've said many times, uh, president Trump, he's not perfect, but I'm sure and glad he's the president, not the other one. Amen. And uh, but I, I don't know if he even realizes it, but he, I believe this with all my heart, knowing anything about the Bible, I believe that he is Donald Trump is a pawn in the hand of God. And I don't know if he understands all that fully. I don't understand it fully, but God is you. God isn't done with America. If that other one would have got in, this country would have slid down to the pits real quick. And God, I believe God knows that, obviously. And God says, I'm not done with America. I'm going to give it another chance. I believe he's given us another chance. I don't know whether they're going to... Don't get me started on all that. I'll, I'll get half mad here. But anyways, Philippians 3.10, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Uh... You say, well, uh, 2 Timothy 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Power and love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 7. And then uh, 2 Timothy 3 5. Having a form of godliness, talking about unsaved false prophets and teachers, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Uh, now as Janais and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. 
He said, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Paul said, my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, Paul said. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But Paul said to Timothy, the young preacher, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He learned them from his mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois, and the Apostle Paul. And it doesn't look like his dad had any part of his spiritual training. His dad was a Gentile Greek. His mother was a Jewess. That's why Paul circumcised Timothy when he first started out with him in the ministry, because the Jews in those quarters knew Timothy. His mom and dad, one, his, mom, his mom was a Jewess, his dad was a Gentile Greek, and he knew that he, Timothy had been circumcised, and the Jews would not accept Timothy's preaching. It don't matter how great a preacher he is, or how well he can, orator he is, or whatever, they're not going to accept Timothy's preaching, and Paul knew that, so Paul had him circumcised. For testimony's sake. Some things you got to do for testimony's sake. Not that it had any bearing on his salvation, to get saved or stay saved. But Paul said circumcision availed nothing in uncircumcision but a new creature, Galatians 6.15. So he wasn't, he wasn't circumcising him to get, keep him saved. He circumcised to the people when Paul took him around all the villages and towns and preached that the people would, uh, the people would uh, accept him. He said, well, how in the world do they know that he circumcised him? News like that gets out. It would get out. You say 2,000 years ago, yeah. You say, how? I don't know. I, wanna, I don't want to go there. Amen. But anyways, uh, power. Uh, so it, the, uh, the uh, uh, Thomas missed some things you miss when you miss. He missed the power of God. And then he missed faith, last of all. He missed faith. You say, where's faith? Verse 25, look what Jesus says to him. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. I always wonder why it says eight days. You say eight days. Well, you say it was a week later, preacher? Yeah. Sunday to Sunday. So that's just a week. I know, but it's eight days. You know, we have our tent revival. It's an eight-day meeting. You say Sunday to Sunday, that's a week. I know, but watch this. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Eight days. That's why it says eight days later. They're meeting again on Sunday. And guess who's there this time? Thomas. Thomas shows up this time. So Jesus is going to direct his message right at Thomas. Verse 26, And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Right after he says, Peace be unto you, he looks right at Thomas. Verse 27, talking about faith now. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and, uh, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, there it is, but believing. Imagine touching the, the body of Jesus and seeing them nail prints in his hands and his feet. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, 16. So, faith. Faith, faith, faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We ought to, uh, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith, Luke 17, 5. Luke 17, 5, increase our faith. Luke 8, 25, Jesus asked, asked the disciples, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Uh... What, it says, shall, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? In Luke 18, verse 8. Luke's full of verses about faith. 
You know what Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, 31 and 32? Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. That's what Jesus said to Peter. I have prayed for thee. Well, I'm glad Jesus prayed for us. Amen. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You say, wasn't he converted? Yeah, he was saved. But uh, he needed to be converted from his, uh, you know, denying the Lord and all that. And we've gone over that before. You walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. You live by faith. Romans 1, 17. The just shall live by faith. You stand by faith. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Joy and faith are in the same verse there. I'll tell you what. A person that's got a lot of faith in God usually has faith. Joy in the Lord. Some Christians have more faith than others. Some Christians, I'm not trying to be mean, but some Christians, if the least little thing happens in their life, it knocks them out. They're, they're done, man. And some Christians can go through all kinds of pain and suffering and tribulations and trials and everything else, and they just remain faithful to God. It's just, just a difference in people. It's just the way it is. I've watched it for 42 years. And uh, people, we walk by faith, we live by faith, and we stand by faith. Now, Hebrews 11 is the chapter on faith. And we're not going to go through the whole thing, but Hebrews 11 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's faith because you hope for it. But Romans 8, 26, 27 says, Hope that is seen is not, is not hope. In other words, I, we don't say, I hope I go to heaven. We know we're going to heaven. But it's on, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure, 1 John 3, 3. It's only a hope in the sense that it hasn't become manifest yet. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 8. Uh, for by it, faith, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Uh, who's the next one? Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated, Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, Enoch was translated, he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, raptured him up, Genesis 5. Because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, the famous verse. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Amen. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's to save people. Yes. That isn't an unsaved. The whole chapter is talking about what saved people did through faith. Amen. whole chapter. Amen. Hebrews 11. It's faith chapter. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Unsaved people can't please God. Right. For he that cometh to God must believe. When you come to God and pray, you must believe that he is, you're, he's God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, Noah, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Well, God said, build a boat, so I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring a flood, a bunch of rain. And Noah didn't say, Huh? What are you going to do? I don't believe it. Well, no, what do you want me to do? I, what do you mean build an ark? An ark out in the middle of nowhere? Come on, God. I mean, that's what I probably would have said. I would have had all these questions. It's implied that Noah just obeyed. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. His household's the only ones that got on the ark. You know, he preached for over 100 years. Boy, he wouldn't have got his name in the big... Christian periodicals, but he's the fastest growing church in America. He preached while he's building that boat. Second Peter 2 calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. You know who got in? You say he must have had a church of 10,000 people. He was probably one of the greatest preachers in his day. He was a great preacher. Guess how many people he had besides himself? Seven. Jesus only had 12, and one of them was the devil. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, 
prepared an ark for the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. When Noah built that ark, he was condemning the world. He was saying, world, guess what? God's going to send a flood. The wrath of God's coming. He's going to drown everybody out because of their filthy, wicked, vile sin, corrupting themselves and everything else. I mean, you don't barely go six chapters and God's already repenting that he made man. Now, when it says repent, it don't mean that God has to repent like I'm a sinner. I, you know, I need to forgive forgiveness. It doesn't mean it that way. It means, in other words, he was sorry. He regretted the fact that he made man. And six, the sixth chapter in the Bible. <coughs> How about them apples? Aren't we something? Man, something. So God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drown the whole mess out. We're going to start over. I'm going to drown the whole mess out, Noah. We're going to start out, and uh, you're going to get off the ark, and then we're going to you and your boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're going to start this thing all over again. And so, uh, and they're uh, uh, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. So, that, and which, by which he condemned the world, became heir of the righteous which by faith. Uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. In other words, he obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, 1 to 10. So as I close... Here, Thomas missed faith. He missed the church service, some things you miss when you miss. I'll tell you what, when you come to the house of the Lord, when you're able to come to the house of the Lord and you're here, you, regardless who's preaching, who's teaching, whatever, it helps build your faith. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's something about some a man getting up and speaking the words of the Lord, teaching, preaching, whatever. And it doesn't really matter his delivery style. Preachers, as you see, we've had preachers in pre you know, the tent meeting, especially we have a bunch of preachers. They all have different styles. Some scream and holler and shout the whole time. The veins in their neck are blood and red and popping out. Everything look like they're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. Or some, some people just get behind and just stand behind the pulpit and just kind of talk. It don't matter. God uses different personalities. And a lot of young preachers, they try to copy other preachers. Up. God just wants a young preacher to be himself. God will mold him and refine him. That's what I told Eric. I said, don't try to be me. Don't try to be this one or that one. Don't try to be Dr. Smell Fungus or, you know, this one or that one. Just be, just be, you know, yourself. And God will mold you and perfect you the way he wants you. Remember that? Remember the potter? He stood up here every night, about right in here. And just, that's what God does to us. Molds us. Just a piece of clay. I'm just a piece of clay. You're just a piece of clay. Dust thou art, and the dust shalt thou return. Genesis 3.19. You say, preacher, that's depressing. No, it's encouraging me that God will use a piece of dirt yeah. like us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And then reward us yeah. at the judgment seat for doing things. We yield to him. All right? So uh, Thomas missed the presence of the Lord. The peace, peace be unto you, the joy and gladness, great commission, power, and faith. He missed all these things. Some things you miss when you miss.